Welcome home, Ava General Baptist Church. It's so great to worship with you today. Um, I got a question for you. Do you ever get distracted? Many times in life we get distracted. I, um, right now I'm, I'm distracted in life by poison ivy. I got into the poison ivy and I realized that Scripture actually talks about poison ivy. In Job chapter 2, when Satan is attacking Job, it says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord... And he struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. And I thought, you know what? Job must have had poison ivy that comes straight from Satan because there's nothing good with it, is it? And so all over my arms, my legs, I got uh, into, some, into some stuff that's irritating me right now. So needless to say, I'm a little bit distracted. What about you? Um, if you're new and uh, with joining us with Ava General Baptist Church, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, Jesus says, My house is to be a house of prayer. I want you to know that I've been praying for you this week. I hope that you've been praying for other people. Um, I think prayer is so important because it's our communication with God. And, and we can pray anytime, anywhere, um, actually One writer puts prayer this way. He says, prayer was the dominant feature of Jesus' life. And it was a reoccurring part of his teaching. Jesus Christ devoted himself to prayer. And he taught about prayer um, to his disciples. And so that's what we're going to dig into today. Is how do we stay focused in a distracted world and praying to God. I'm so thankful for your generosity. It's truly an encouragement to me and those that it's impacting. We are truly better together because of people like you. And I, if you'd like to give today, you can do so at avageneral.com. Just click on the blue online giving tab and you'll be directed through the steps there. What do you long for? You see, our focus on heaven is a key component in our spiritual disciplines that sustain us through the distractions of life. Um, maybe you've been distracted lately. I talked with one couple who recently moved and they said they had slipped up on their Bible reading, their studying, because they they had moved and it was a distraction to them. And so anything can be a distraction to us. It doesn't have to be some wicked, evil sin. It could be anything that would take our focus off of God and the work that he has us to do. But I want us to understand today that it's very, very dangerous to have a blurred or distracted vision or perspective in life. My wife was at a sleepover in high school, and then when she was coming back, uh, she woke up that morning, she was going to volleyball practice, and she said, you know what, it's just across town, I don't need to put my contacts in. She said that was, could have been a very costly mistake, because she realized that she blew right through the stop sign, because she didn't even see it, because she had uh, a d- blurred vision, she was distracted. It's called being nearsighted, meaning that you can only see what's right in front of you. And sometimes in this life, we are nearsighted. It's kind of like the chicken little syndrome. You remember the fable chicken little where this chicken's walking around and an acorn falls on his head. And in a panic, he goes to his friends and gets his friends all in a frenzy because the sky is falling. The sky is falling. The earth is ending. Well, you and I have those acorns, but they may not be physical acorns. These acorns that fall from the sky that we hone in on and we focus on in our nearsightedness could be our health. It could be something that's troubling you right now about your physical health. And so you need to to, uh, to refocus on God, to step back and, and to have your nearsightedness corrected. Maybe that acorn that falls on your head are news headlines. Oh my, these news headlines over and over each and every day that we just get bombarded with can completely overwhelm us and distract us from God. Maybe it's the rising fuel and food prices which is causing hurts and hardships on many, many Americans. Maybe it's something that somebody said to you. That all you can see is that acorn, and all you can hear is that acorn that came down from something somebody somebody said to you. Whatever your acorn is today, I want us to throw that acorn as far away from us as possible. We need a clear view. We need a clear perspective in life. 
And when you and I long for heaven, we correct our nearsightedness. It's the lens for us to filter everything through. This is exactly how Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. One man once said, True prayer is a strenuous spiritual exercise. True prayer is really a strenuous spiritual exercise that demands the utmost mental discipline and concentration. How do you and I long for home and practice this spiritual exercise of prayer without being distracted with the present situation in our lives? We talked about this last week. How do we, uh, how do we stay focused on God? Well, we have to focus on the goal. Jesus said, Pray then like this, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what is the goal of heaven? The goal of heaven is salvation and growth of souls. The goal of God is for you and I to surrender to him and to, um, and to believe in him for salvation and to grow in our relationship with him. Jesus, and I see this in his life in scripture, Jesus constantly withdrew to have a clear view. He constantly withdrew to have a clear view. And when he withdrew to have a clear view, he filtered everything through heaven's lens. It's kind of like at the eye doctor when you go in and they say, they put the two lenses down and they say, left or right? One, two, one, two. And they put all the lenses down. It starts to get to a point where I'm like, I don't know that there was a difference in that last lens. But I guess it's some sick game optometrists play. But it's like when they put the lenses there and then finally they get the lens combination that works for your eyes to bring everything into focus, those objects that are near and also those objects that are far. Well, in our walk with God, we have to understand we need a clear view. We need a clear focus. We need the correct lens. And the correct lens to see life through is the lens through heaven. Us longing for home, us longing for something outside of ourselves. And that something, that something is a someone. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know, um, when we filter everything through heaven's lens, we see that God is near to us. We see that God is near to us. I want to draw your attention to verse 9 in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, Our Father in heaven. I don't know what kind of earthly father you've had. But I want us to focus on what scripture says about what a good father is. You see this word father is the word pater. It means one who imparts life and is committed to it. Now that's the difference that I want us to see. We have a bunch of dads in this world who they give life or they participate in the giving of life. But they never want any part of it. And that may be you, that may be your story, and that's a, that's a hard thing for you to think of any good father, because you didn't have a good father figure growing up. Well, I'm here to tell you, God's not like that. When scripture says our heavenly father, that word means somebody who gives life, who imparts life, but who also is directly committed to it. That's what's so amazing when we think about who we are. We are one person in this world. And I am so overwhelmed to know that God cares about this one person. That he wants to walk and talk and have a relationship with me. And something we understand that as we spend more and more time around God, our Heavenly Father, we start to talk and to act like him. Now in this world, some of us dread speaking like our parents. We almost slap ourselves when we say a phrase that our parents said, that our dad or our mom said. And we're like, oh, we need to shake out of this. But it's truly the people you spend the most time around are who you start acting like as well. So that is what's so huge about you and I filtering everything we see in this life through heaven's lens. So that we can filter it through God and say, God, I don't understand this situation. I need you to help me understand this. I need you to show me how to act 
or how to respond in this situation. And when we filter things through heaven's lens, we realize that God is near as a good, good father. He not only gives us life and gives us salvation, but he walks with us in that salvation, in that life that we live with him. In Revelation chapter 21, the, uh, John saw this vision. He said, then I saw a new heaven and I saw a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Thank God for that. That God wants to dwell within us. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. When you and I filter this life through heaven's lens. We realize that God makes everything complete. And when we filter and live heaven on earth. And we live on earth as it is in heaven. That means that God comforts us. For God to comfort us, what does he have to do? He has to be near us. And that's exactly what scripture says. Is that God is near us like a heavenly father. And when we realize that in heaven, death shall be no more. We recognize that on earth, we're not going to die. When our physical bodies die... And we take our last breath. Our soul is going to live on with God in eternity. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. What you and I are experiencing right now. And our acorns that all we can focus on is like chicken little with that acorn. The sky is falling. My world is falling apart. My health is deteriorating right now. What do I do God? And God says... That's passing away. That acorn is going to be gone. You need to stop focusing on that and get a wider view. Because when heaven is our filter, we clearly see that God is near to us. And when God is near to us, what can man do to us? What can Satan do to us? The answer is nothing. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39, the Apostle Paul says the same thing. He says, as God is for us, who can be against us? We have true freedom in Christ. And when we filter this life through heaven's lens, we're able to step back and say, I have freedom over this situation right now. Even though I don't, it doesn't look like it, even though I don't know what's really going on, I have freedom here. We also, when we filter everything through heaven's lens, we see that God provides for us. Jesus Christ said in his prayer, To the disciples, he says, you need to pray like this. God, give us this day our daily bread. When's the last time that you recognize God's provisions in your life? When's the last time you stepped back and said, thank you, God, for giving me my daily bread? I want you to pay attention to that same passage in Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. And John said, he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and they are true. And he said to me, It is done. I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, God says. To the one who is thirsty, I will give from the spring of water life without payment. I will give you everlasting life, forever quenching your thirst, your desire. So if you long for heaven... That's what you're getting. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. But he says, for the one who comes to me, I will give you everything. When Jesus was walking on this earth, he says, God will provide for you. 
And he puts it in an earthly context. He says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For to everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. God's going to answer you. He's going to be there for you. He says, which of you, if your son asks him, if your son asks you for bread, will give him a stone? Of course you wouldn't do that. You would give your child what they needed. Or to the one, if he asked for a fish, you would give him a serpent. Would you do that if your son asked you for something to eat and you would give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Do you believe God is good? Do you believe he truly cares for you? Jesus says, my Father, God in heaven, is good. And when you and I filter everything through heaven's lens, we start to focus on what God has given us rather than what we think he's withholding from us. Maybe Satan has had you so distracted on the acorn that God has not given you fill in the blank. What has God not given you? What have you asked for that God has not uh, just blessed you with or, or taken care of in your life? Because what Satan can do a lot of the times is he can make us focus in on that acorn saying, yes, God's withholding something from you. He is evil. He is bad. He is far from good. But when you and I filter this world, our life, through the correct lens, we fix our nearsightedness. We, we start focusing on what God has given us rather than what we think he's withholding from us. Maybe for you to clear distractions out of your life is as simple as saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what has he done today? Do you have lodging? Do you have food? Do you have clothes? Thank you, God, for this day. This is something I've started doing in my life, and it's made a huge impact on me being distracted by the things of this world. Because I'm able to step back and say, okay, God, I'm looking toward heaven. I'm filtering everything through that lens. And then when I look at this earth, it all seems so trivial sometimes. Because I have a bigger vision, a bigger view of life. When you and I filter everything through heaven's lens, we see that God is near. We see how he provides for us, and we see how real redemption is. Jesus ends this prayer with a few words that are very, very difficult for us today. He says, Father, forgive, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. The whole point... Of Jesus Christ coming to this earth. Was to buy us back. Do you realize that? We were bound up. In chains and shackles. In a jail cell by Satan. Awaiting an eternal death in hell. Separated from God forever. Until Jesus Christ came to the cross. And he says no that child's mine. I'm going to buy them back. And so he purchased us with his precious blood. Because sin off, because there is sin, because there is no disobedience to God, there has to be a punishment. And that punishment, that sacrifice, was alluded to by animals for many, many years throughout the Old Testament. Until Jesus Christ came and he says, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. It is finished. I am the last sacrifice. I'm the perfect sacrifice. I will step in as a substitution for you. And I will take your punishment upon myself so that you can have freedom. So you can be redeemed. When we filter things through heaven's lens, we see how real redemption is. If we're going to live the kingdom of God on earth, we have to live with the eyes of redemption. We have to live with the eyes of forgiveness that Jesus Christ gives to us. In Revelation chapter 22 verses 3 through 5. He says, no longer in heaven will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. In heaven, redemption is real. 
There's nothing that's cursed in heaven. Satan is not there. His demons are not there. Those who are not following God are not there. Everything is pure. Everything is perfect because it's God who dwells within heaven. And he says, they, the people of God will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. There won't be any more darkness at all. They will need no light of lamp. They won't need any sun for the Lord their God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. When we filter everything through heaven's lens, we realize how real redemption is. We realize when we look up to heaven, all of us, each and every one, are to receive forgiveness. We're to receive what God has given us. And we're not only supposed to receive it, but we're also supposed to give as we have received. And we're supposed to give what we've received. Well, what have we received from God? First and foremost, His love, His forgiveness, His grace, His peace, His joy. So what would it look like for you to live heaven on earth this week? It would look like you and I giving love to other people, even when they don't deserve it. It'd be like you and I offering forgiveness to other people, even if they don't deserve it. It's us offering grace and peace and joy to other people, because that's what we've received from God. And when we have a heavenly filter and a redeemed view, we look at life differently. We are then motivated by compassion. We're motivated out of a love for other people. We see other people as souls to lead to Jesus Christ rather than problems to rid our lives of. This is a huge shift in how we view people. As we see people, we can see them as problems just to rid our lives of, but truly they are souls to lead to Jesus. We see our spouse as a partner instead of the enemy, and maybe that's something you've been struggling with lately. You've seen your spouse as the enemy. Your spouse is the enemy Satan is. And I'm not saying that you are married to Satan. But what I'm saying is that God has given you a partner in this life to live and to grow with. And when we have a redeemed view, we have a view of our partner, our spouse, as a teammate. We go back to the Garden of Eden. The first thing Satan did was drove a wedge between the family He drove the wedge between man and woman, and marriage has been flawed ever since. But God is redeeming marriages, and I want you to believe that. If your marriage needs redeemed, I want you to reach out. Maybe some counseling is what you need to go through. Maybe I'm talking with someone else. Maybe for you, praying for your spouse is a first step that you need to take. When we have a heavenly filter And a redeemed view. We see troubling situations not as an attack from God. But something that God could use for good. For instance. Our border crisis. We can think many negative things about our southern border. And all kinds of people who are flooding into our nation. This last week I was talking with somebody whose husband is deployed down south. And they are on the border patrol. And they challenged my view of this. They have a redeemed view that I didn't necessarily have. She said, I asked her, I said, what's going on? What are his takeaways for working down there in the midst of it all? She said, honestly, Tim, it's so sad. What do you mean? She said, it's so sad because a lot of the drugs that are coming through means that there's a drug market in our nation to receive and to sell and to use those drugs. A lot of the people that are smuggling drugs, smuggling people over, they just want a better life for themselves. And and yes, there are some that are criminals in there, but It points to our need to be Jesus Christ in this world. To shine his light to a dark, dark world. I'm like, man. This lady has a redeemed view. And I was convicted. I need to see people as souls to lead to Jesus Christ. Rather than problems to rid our lives of. So this week. 
first and foremost, if you're not following Jesus Christ, I would say, what are you waiting for? He's waiting for you to knock on that door and he's ready to open and invite you into his kingdom. If you are living for Jesus Christ, I want you to pray for people around you. I want you to reach out to people around you and and to let God lead you to set other people free because that's what a lens that's filtered through um, that's focused on heaven. That's what a lens sees. They see clearly not the acorns that are right in front of us, not all the problems that are building up and stacking up right here, but we're able to set back and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do with my pile of acorns? What do you want me to do in this life to honor you, Jesus Christ? I want to pray over you right now. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for each and every person who's worshiping with us today. God, I pray that you would show us how to trust you more and more every day for salvation, for growth, for our health, for our um, jobs, for for our purpose in this life, God, that we would follow you. We would filter everything through your lens, God. And as we do, that we get a different view of this life, a redeemed view of this life. Lord, I thank you so much for this day, and I pray that you would lead, guide, and direct us as you see fit, that you would show us one person, one couple, or one family to talk with this week, to encourage in some way this week, God, and that we would be at your harvest work, building up souls to your kingdom. God, we love you. We praise you, and we thank you for this day. And it's in your precious and holy name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. May God bless you, may he keep you, and may he lead you in his peace this week. Take care.